In a modern sense, when we say the word ecology or ecological, sometimes our mind automatically drifts to environmental sciences, things to do with nature and preserving uh, the natural world around us. And that certainly is related to ecology and an important aspect of that word and use for that word. But ecology and ecological really just refers to, in general, a, an interconnectedness between things or relationship between things or the sense of community and how that impacts each of those things and how they how they work together and how they work individually and so forth so that's the broader sense of ecological brings us today to our study of media so we're going to take a look today at ecological analysis as a framework for critical media studies and apply ecology to the, the world of media uh, so to do that, let's start with exactly what we mean by that. So ecological analysis is simply, um, you know, examining media and the role of media ecology in the perception, understanding, feeling, and value of an artifact. So applying that sense of the, the, the community or the world in which that media was created and where it lives uh, and, and the world that finds itself now, examining that world of media ecology and applying that then to the perception, understanding, feeling, or value, and or value of an artifact. This is really, ecological analysis is really grounded in what we call medium theory. Medium theory um, simply says that the technology or individual medium of communication, remember medium is just a channel of communication, the means through which um, that, that uh, message is relayed. So the technology or individual medium or channel of communication is equally important, or in some cases even more important, than the content of the media to, our, to understanding our social environment. And so we can look at not only what the media says, what that, what that artifact is, and what, what message it's trying to convey, but how they choose to convey it. And uh, that, that medium, that channel is significant in helping us understand that and helping us understand how it fits into that uh, environment, how it impacts those things. So, so that's medium theory. And medium theory really at this point is just a kind of an umbrella theory for a variety of other things. And we're going to focus on um, two very specific um, types of media theory or extensions of media theory uh, in this video. So we're going to take a look at technological determinism and media ecology, the extension then of that into media ecology. So, but to start, we're going to take a look at specifically at medium theory. Now, medium theory, again, um, it has to do with the channel of communication and how that impacts how that communication and that artifact effect affects the uh, environment around it. So medium theory starts with the principle that each medium has a relatively unique and fixed set of characteristics. So there are things that are true about these things. We, when we look at the different types of mass media, we know that radio is different than TV and TV is different than uh, different social media platforms. And all of those are different than newspapers and so forth, right? Each of them has unique and fixed sets of characteristics. And, and we can see this even more clearly uh, in modern times here. If we look at specifically at social media and think about the different social media platforms and how they're different, each of them has unique characteristics, things that are established about them, things that we really, you know, we attach to each of these things. So, um, they are, they are unique and they have this fixed set of characteristics that set them apart from others. Every medium has that then. Uh, also, these characteristics then produce a particular communication environment. So the type of, of you know, characteristics and, and um, uh, things like that about that specific medium will then again establish a kind of particular communication environment, will lend itself to specific things. So we think then about, again, looking at different types of social media, for example, Twitter versus Facebook versus Instagram. And I know that, you know, I, I hear a lot of people like, especially uh, celebrities or people who are who are prominent in media talking about how they, they don't even get on Twitter anymore. It's just mean. It's just people complaining. It's just people, you know, trying to bring them down or trying to bait them into something. And so they just I've heard a lot of people just say, look, I just avoid Twitter. If you're a known personality, it's so just not on Twitter. I don't I don't really check it. I don't pay any attention. They say I focus on Instagram where there's more positive posts and they like the pictures and things. So uh, they, the general sense, at least at this moment, is that. Twitter is, is for arguing and for mean people and, and Instagram is for more just, you know, social interaction and positivity and Facebook is for old people, right? And, and Snapchat and the others are for younger people. But, uh, so Facebook, Facebook has largely been abandoned for people of my age or older. Um, but you know, Twitter's an important, 
avenue for news gathering and 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 for for sharing messages of that nature but really it's it's become um, very divisive in many ways because of the different characteristics both that it's a limited set of characters and that uh, just just the way that it's been adapted for use in our society today um, that produces that particular communication environment has that feel twitter has that kind of mean feel to it and instagram just at the moment anyway has a more positive vibe it seems like so the characteristics then are going to produce that particular communication environment then finally the communication environment has consequences for human consciousness and social organization now bear in mind these consequences could be positive or they could be negative or could be mixed bag typically it's it's that mixed bag it, it's a little bit of both we sacrifice one for the other right but it's going to impact our consciousness and and the way that we organize socially so we can look at this one example of this would be you know back when we had the huge days of network television right network television was king uh, you, you really, if you were going to watch TV, you were going to watch a couple of these channels. Cable was there, but, but even that wasn't nearly as popular shows at that time, popular shows at that time were getting tens of millions of viewers in every episode, right? That's unheard of today. You would not, you, you, we probably won't ever see that again because the media landscape is so fragmented. People find their own specific things. And, and so you don't see those large groups of people tuning in for the same thing on a Thursday night or on a Wednesday night or whatever. So that the next day when you're at work, everybody's talking about that, right? We don't have that because we don't have that, that the prominence of network, you know, and the limitations of network television anymore. We have the ability to, to seek out and watch something when we want and how we want and what we want and all of that. Right. But for example, when we had network television, you had, um, one, one, uh, prominent example of this was from the television show, Will and Grace and the impact that many people believe that it had on the kind of the understanding and acceptance of the LGBTQ community and maybe even hastening us toward uh, legalization of gay marriage. Right. I mean, it could have had that big of an impact. It was one of those things that really, um, touched everybody in the country in some way. That doesn't mean everybody liked it. and doesn't mean everybody thought it was positive, uh, but it did. I mean, but everybody was aware of it. And uh, so you, you had that bit central identification of that artifact because of the media that was prominent at that time, right now in social, the age of social media and fragmentation, we just, you just don't have that anymore. Uh, another uh, way to look at this is the idea of, you know, social media has been great for helping us maintain connection to, to family and friends over the years. And we, we, we stay in contact or at least, you know, see pictures and things of people that we would never have seen maybe prior to that, you know, or, you know, prior to that time, we, these are people we would have lost touch with and not seen as much and not been able to know, you know, what they were doing every day and what they're eating every day and so forth. We wouldn't have those pictures of their food all the time. But at the same time, social media is very cultivated, right? In the sense that, uh, that we choose what to put on there and what not to put on there. Typically, we're only putting our best stuff on there. We're putting our highlights on there and things. We're not putting that, you know, and then when we spill the spaghetti sauce all over the kitchen, we're putting the perfect picture of our family on there, right? So it can, in that sense, though, because that's all we see of people, it can create this kind of unrealistic uh, identification of, of what we should be and make us feel worse about ourselves in many ways. Can have, that's a very real impact these days is that social media in some ways makes people feel worse about themselves because they feel like they're not keeping up. They see you know, all these other things, not thinking about the fact that this is highly cultivated, that these people are having all the same struggles, more than likely having all the same struggles as everybody else, but that's not what we're seeing, right? Uh, so that's been another impact of the change in technology and the, the way that the medium then has impacted how we see ourselves, how we see our, our place in society and how we view culture in general. One final example here is the way that we uh, use social media to kind of um, coalesce as groups and in movements, um, how social media can create that movement so much faster and so much easier um, than, than it would have been possible before that. And we see that examples of that all the time with groups really rising and getting together and becoming extremely popular and powerful uh, because of their social media presence and ability and the connection that people have there. Right. So um, that's a, a very real thing. But at the same time, then again, because we're kind of forming these groups and tribes in social media, um, we also have some issues because um, social media is anonymous when we want it to be. Right. It can be anonymous, which gives people uh, much more um, 
confidence and how they talk about themselves and what they say to other people we have the rise of what we call the disinhibition effect. So that, uh, that is when we're on, uh, when we're communicating via social media, our inhibitions are lowered and we say things to people that we might not say to them if we were face to face with them. If we were communicating to them on an in-person basis, these are things we probably wouldn't say to them or, uh, you know, about them if they were face to face, but because of the anonymity of social media, media and the, and the distance, the disconnection uh, between us, because there's a, um, a piece of technology between us, then we, then we find that confidence. Our confidence online is much larger than, than it usually is probably offline uh, because of that disinhibition effect. And we do and say things we wouldn't otherwise. And it's really, in some ways has, you know, in politics, we can, we can see this very clearly you almost have red Twitter and blue Twitter, right. In terms of, you know, Democrats and Republicans and, and on, on the extreme ends where they take these extreme stances. And because of our media environment, we get into these echo chambers where we only hear things that we already agree with and people are feeding that. And so anybody who dares to um, contradict whatever it is we believe, boy, we shout them down in the strongest possible terms and tell them how dumb they are and all this kind of, I mean, in some ways has brought us together. Social media has, but in many ways it is also uh, created some large fractures in relationships and in, in our relationship as a, as a nation, really. So, um, again, positives, negatives, it's usually a mixed bag. It's hardly ever one thing or the other and hardly anything in life is one thing or the other entirely. And the media environment is no, no different than that. So about medium theory just talks about how okay, the, the channel that we use for this does affect because of the characteristics of that channel, it impacts and has an effect on, on how we communicate how we relate and how we organize as a society, as a society then. It's so one of the most uh, significant theories to evolve out of medium theory is technological determinism, which was put forth by this gentleman here, Marshall McLuhan. Um, so Marshall McLuhan was a professor who, who developed this idea of technological determinism. He basically said that a society's technology determines its cultural values, social structure, and history, that all of these things really are so intertwined with technology and are pushed forward by this technology. And that, um, uh, you so uh, in addition to that, then social progress is driven by technological innovation so that it's, you know, that we see these major leaps in, in society that and the major leaps that our society has taken forward has been a direct result of the development of significant technology of some sort. And so social progress is driven by technological innovation. Then he indicated that it also um, has the, a significant impact technology does on the nature of human relationships. Okay. So technological determinism then seeks to understand how technology impacts human relationships and what the, what the connection is there. He started by looking at what he, and describing this, the, the history of the world via this kind of media. So media history, um, starting with the tribal age, right? Where, um, when we initially existed in a preliterate society. So this was before the written word, when we were completely reliant on oral communication, oral history, and everything had to be spoken word. We had no written communication. We were in the tribal age and everything was very connected. People were very much connected to that tribe. Very, the tribe was central to everything. And, uh, and people, because if you went 10 miles away, then you had somebody speaking a different language and having different cultures and you just, you know, you just wouldn't survive there maybe. Um, so you, you were really reliant on the tribe for your survival and certainly for any information, any understanding of your history and of the world around you. Um, you were totally reliant on your tribe and on people then who spoke the same language as you. But then we have the development of the written word, right? And they have what we call the literacy age. So written communication was developed so that people could communicate across distances. People could share history across a longer period of time by writing it down instead of just having to rely on somebody else telling them what it was. And that allowed us to kind of separate a little bit from the tribe. We were still very much connected to the tribe, but we could be physically somewhere else uh, and still be connected to that tribe, still get uh, written messages and still um, have an understanding of who we are and, and what was happening, those types of things, even though we weren't necessarily in the same geographic location. So we started to see a little bit of separation then at times. 
Then you have the development of the printing press. And this just changed everything. It's one of the most significant inventions in the history of the world is the printing press. This allowed a greater number of people to be literate by far. I mean, you know, massive ex explosion in the amount of literate people that you have in the world, people who could read and write because um, the, the resources are now available to do that. Um, so you have then the prolif prolif proliferation of kind of independent thinking. You're no longer relying on someone else to share this information with you or just having to believe what they say about something. Now you can think for yourselves. You can read it and learn it for yourselves. You can think for yourself. You can. So the print age really um, did all of that for us, but it also just allowed us then to be much less centralized around a tribe. We could be in a lot of different places and still get the information that we needed, still uh, gain an education, still learn about our history and still um, communicate with the, the with our community, even though, again, we're not physically near them. So you see this kind of coincided then as well with the expansion of the United States here in North America, for example, the people, people exploring uh, the, you know, European exploration of the United States was fueled by the printage. You could, you could be out on the frontier, but still be connected. And uh, so you could, you didn't have to rely on being in a central location to be connected with your community. So the print age really um, pushed humans uh, further apart from one another in a tribal sense. The kind of the, the final nail in that tribal coffin, so to speak, that that mindset came with the electronic age, the development of radio and television, because these really allow us to be completely apart from our tribe and yet still be incredibly connected to it. We're all, again, watching the same TV shows, for example, you know, when, when we had especially the, you know, the advent of network TV you only had a couple of channels. Even when I was growing up, we really only had a couple of channels with cable a little bit later, but. Um, but we watched all the same TV shows. When I went to school, it was a pretty good chance that, that everybody else had watched the same thing I did on TV the night before because there wasn't much else on. And because there were, you know, these shows were so popular then and that's such a large viewership that we were still incredibly connected, incredibly well informed, even though we were very much separated. We weren't, we didn't have that kind of uh, interconnectedness with, uh, our, the, those around us that we did when we were uh, in that tribal sense, right? So we have kind of individualist individualism, right? The development of the individual as, as the central component in our story, as opposed to I'm a part of the shared history, the shared existence and collectivistic existence. So the electronic age um, really presented us with the opportunity to be connected and yet separate at the same time. Now, that's as far as McLuhan got because he passed away before we got into the, the more modern technology. But now we have uh, what, what there are a couple of different names for it, but what we're going to call it is the new media age. We are in that new media age where now, you know, in the electronic age, we were reliant on those central um, providers and, and producers of content that, that got to all of us. Again, we were all watching the same TV show because, because that's what was on. And there were, it was really tough to make a TV show and to put it out there. So, um, there were only a couple of people doing it, you know, a very small group of people that were doing that. So we all just watched whatever they were putting out in the new media age. That's not the case. Everybody's a producer of, of content, right? And everybody's sharing it with one another. And it's, it's very decentralized. All the, the information is very decentralized. So we're now not only consumers of the media, but we are producers of the media. We have, we have a multitude of content creators, as we know, and, uh, and we have the ability to connect with people on a level and, and have all this knowledge at a level that we've never had in, the, in any point in human history, for sure. So that's the next kind of, you know, again, brings us together, brings us some connectedness, but at the same time, even isolates, isolates us even further uh, and, and gives us this false sense almost in some ways of connectedness, gives us a really almost false sense of connectedness, even though we are in many ways, extremely isolated, right? So uh, we have this new media age then. So it just kind of walks you through uh, McLuhan's media history. And he would say, though, that technology then, of course, is the driving force behind all of these societal developments. And the, and the most significant impact on society is the technology that we use and specifically that we use to communicate. Uh, McLuhan was famous for saying this. He, he, he said the medium is the message. The medium is the message. He went on to say, this is merely to say that the personal and social consequences of any medium, that is of any extension of ourselves, because we are creating that media, right, result from the new scale that is introduced into our affairs by each extension of ourselves or by any new technology. So he would say the medium is the message in the sense that 
you know, how that information is, is conveyed and how we receive it and how we engage in that media is just as important as the content itself of that message. Okay. So that's technological determinism in a nutshell. Moving beyond that, we had a gentleman named Neil Postman who, who really developed what we call media ecology, sort of a modernization and a further extension of technological determinism. Taking it beyond that, he Postman said that um, holistic systems based examinations of symbiotic relationship between humans, technology and environment. That is media ecology, okay. a holistic systems based examination of the symbiotic relationship, meaning that shared relationship back and forth between humans, technology and the environment. Remember, McLuhan said, no, technology drives society. Technology drives culture. Postman says that's really this uh, combination of the, everything kind of pushes each other. And it's, you know, humans, technology and the environment all kind of come together and and push each other forward, right? And have, have this symbiotic relationship with one another. So our aim really is to increase the awareness of those mutual effects. The aim of media ecology should be to uh, increase the awareness and be aware of the effects between these things and how they do impact one another. Uh, that this is a dynamic process rather than, as McLuhan said, technology as the singular driving force. So it's not just technology pushing us forward. It's it's a dynamic process that changes and, and goes in waves and, and varies. And in this sense, it really is very much like, like when we talked about it, when I said earlier, when we think of ecology, we think of the environment. This really is media as this, this sort of, to use an analogy of the ecology, like, like you would have on the, uh, you know, on the African plains right here and the Sahara plains or whatever, but, you know, you have this ecology and all these, these animals and the resources and the environment all have this symbiotic relationship. They all work together. And when you change something within that, if we, if we had this, you know, setting and then we drop in a T-Rex, right? That's going to be a problem as we learned uh, fully in Jurassic Park and then the Jurassic World movies. We know that that would be an issue, right? That that, that would change the dynamic here, but it is always changing as the water goes away. The animals migrate differently, which causes different things. And then that changes the water flow itself. And then it, so all of these things affect one another. It's not just one thing driving everything else forward in media ecology. It's that all of these things work together and they influence one another. And that then changes the entire environment. So again, just to, to, to summarize here, technological, technological determinism says that first technology evolves, humans then adapt to that. Then the technology evolves and humans adapt again and so forth. But it's the technology that drives that. And I mean, people are coming up with that technology, but but we are constantly then being driven and pushed forward by that technology, right? But uh, uh, Postman and media ecology then have a different cycle. For that cycle, we'd say that the mediated communication is there, right? We have this this mediated communication that exists, this uh, communication that's going out to the world. Then new tools are developed as a result of that, right? New, we, we as a society develop new tools and we develop new ways of doing things. Uh, and eventually, you know, as we saw... For example, uh, mediated community, just again, to look at social media as an example and the development of social media, right? So we have this media mediated communication, this form that, that is, that now exists, right? So take Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is. Uh, and these new tools are developed then, right? So from, if you had Facebook for a long time, then Twitter came along and kind of changed the game. So the new tools are developed. People are learning how to use those. And then you have the adaption, uh, or uh, sorry, adoption of that new technology. Right. The adoption of that new technology. You have people on the forefront. You have people who the first ones who used Facebook or the people who first started using Twitter or Instagram or whatever. You had you know, some significant people adopting this new technology and it grew further and further in the society um, to the point where it then became this normalization. And now it's it's crazy if you don't have a Facebook account or if you're not on social media, that's that's considered abnormal right? to not have any of that. All of that will then, of course, impact our mediated communication as we've seen, for example, you know, you could, you could, I think you could draw a direct line from social media to the development of streaming technologies and, and the way we view media in that way now and the way we consume television differently now. Um, so, and, and then that's going to create new things if we're seeing now with them, you know, we just, uh, it's constantly evolving and we affect it and it affects us and, and so forth. Right. So we are, in fact, living in the era of new media then. But we were firmly in that era of new media 
And, uh, and that brings with it a lot of different uh, considerations and challenges and opportunities and things. So let's take a look at that for a second as we uh, think about the, the era in which we live and how that affects how we um, uh, interact with our media. So defining new, me new media, first of all, new media is any media that uses computing technology to create, store, and distribute data. So anything essentially that has a microchip would be considered new media. Right. So anything that has microchips, so certainly your phones, your tablets, even your TVs now, um, radio, certainly um, all of those things now have microchips. So really, they're all kinds of um, new media in a sense, but but really has to do with anything that uses that computing technology in some way. So it has a microchip, then we're calling it new media. So some of the characteristics of new media um, include, first of all, that it's digital. Okay. It's digital. It's, uh, it exists in digital forms and even beyond, you know, we don't, you know, when I grew up using, I grew up with cassette tapes and CDs and albums and things like that, or, you know, TV that was, that was analog on a TV, on a television set, just, you know, but now everything is digital. Everything is, is uh, available through that, the computing technology. And so pretty much any media that we're going to interact with is available in a digital form. It's also though variable. New media is variable. So we don't just want our TV shows on the TV anymore. I don't just want to watch my TV. Certainly, I don't just want to watch it at a certain time or day. Uh, I want to have it available anytime, but also I want to be able to watch it on my phone or I want to be able to, to watch it on my tablet or my computer or the TV or uh, all at once or push it from one to the other. I want it to be variable. It's got to be flexible in that regard, right? So it's got to, it's got to have that, that sense of variability. Uh, it also is interactive. In new media is interactive. It used to be again in the in the even in the electronic age. Talking about radio, TV, in the electronic age, was not interactive. It was one way. It didn't really communicate a lot with the uh, television shows or different people like that. It was it was you know. But now we can directly reach out to those things. It's very interactive. Um, we have the ability to to to, um, to respond to and vote on things in the moment, right? For these game shows and things we can vote or, or talent shows, we can vote on these things in the moment. Uh, we can join uh, groups and, and influence what happens on a show or, or whether a show is canceled or not. It's very interactive. The new media is very interactive. It's also very connective in the sense that uh, it's, it's, it's very, um, uh, brings us together in a, in a way that, uh, you know, we get these groups, for example, you get, you know, you really enjoy a show or, or a band or whatever. It can, it can really help you establish a connection with one another, but, and you have the avenue to find that connection, um, through, uh, it, you know, through, um, exploration in new media as well to find other people who also love that thing and, and want to be a part of it. And, and it's very, uh, connective. It's also very virtual, highly virtual, right? So it's, it's, it has this idea of fantasy though, too. I mean, that, that it doesn't have to be, um, uh, there in real life. It's, it's, it's very much a virtual experience for us. So some of the impacts of new media, some of the, the ways that this has impacted us, um, first of all, are associational, that new media is associational. When I was growing up, everything was very linear. A, the, a to B to B C, right? When I read a book, it was from the first page to the last page. Uh, when I listened to music, it was, you know, on a cassette tape, you, you just listened to it straight through, basically. Uh, you didn't just pick one song and play it. And, I mean, it was a pain. You had to rewind and do all that kind of stuff. Or to find a song was difficult. So it was very linear, right? But um, new media is a very associational. It's very, you know, jumps from here to there. And, and it's, it's, you know, it doesn't have to happen in a straight line. It's not, uh, not intended to be taken in in a linear way way, right? So instead of reading a book from, um, front to back, uh, you know, like I said, I would start a book at the page one and I would go straight through. I mean, that's how it, now not only for reading for pleasure, but our textbooks work that way. And that's how we learned was from, you know, page one to the end. Okay. I listened to tapes, for example, I listened to uh, a lot of music, including this, my favorite album, Growing Up uh, Injustice for All by Metallica. I love that album. I would listen to it from start to finish, front to back, all the way through though. Wouldn't just, you know, pick a couple of songs and put them on a mix. Uh, you mean you could, but that was a hassle. So you had, I just listened to them from start to finish from front to back all the way through. And there was sometimes a theme that would go through that music has changed significantly because it's not associational in that way anymore. And now you can just surf 
whatever. The web is nonlinear. You go, go from link to link. You get pulled down these rabbit holes, right? Or rabbit trails. And, uh, and you, you end up on who knows where on I have me on YouTube all the time. I end up uh, on all kinds of different videos, home improvement videos that I didn't know I was wanted to want learning, you know, about elect, doing electrical work and things that I didn't even know I wanted to know about. But there I am three hours later, I'm clicking on these links and I'm going through and it's very nonlinear. Um, the same with our, our TV. It's no longer um, really a linear thing where you know that you have to be there Thursday nights at 830 if you want to see this show. And it's not going to be, you know, re-airing or you can't record it and that kind of thing, really, without a VCR. It's a hassle. So uh, you just were there at 830. On, now I can watch what I want, when I want. I can bounce around from show to show. I can come back to it. I can put it on different um, different types of media platforms. and things. So um, it's very associational what we would call association. It's not linear at all. It's, very, it's all over the place here. Okay. Uh, it's also contingent. New media is contingent. There are very few any more things that we would say, you know, this is, there are very few absolute truths about the media. First of all, not only do we have to question it and we have to really think about it, but, but for whatever standpoint you can find, you can find somebody else or some other uh, thing to support the opposite view, right? So now everything is very contingent and maybe, yeah, this is true, but I guess maybe this is true as well. And it may only be true until I hit the refresh button on my web browser, right? And then it may be something else may be true, right? So, uh, our, uh, you know, we feel like knowledge today is very contingent uh, and not as you know, definitive. It used to be, you know, what you read in a book was gospel and that was it. And now we can go find other information to kind of contradict that if we wish. Media and new media is also prosumptive. Okay. And this is a combination of a, a couple of different things, a couple of different words. It's first of all, consumptive. So we, so we do consume media, but we also produce media. Uh, again, again, many of us are, are content creators, just like I am. And you're, if you're watching this video, if you've made it this far, thank you very much for watching and for paying attention. But, uh, but you know, I am a prosumptive um, media um, uh, user. Right. So I'm not only consuming media, I certainly consume a lot of media. I watch videos, I watch TV, I read things. I do. So I consume media, but I'm also producing it. I'm a content creator. So I am, I am an example of a presumptive person. And that applies, that term would apply to, to most of us to, to some extent, to some, um, to some, you know, to some degree, we are all presumptive. Uh, and that's an, another impact of the media is that we've all become presumptive. And finally, media is effective. It's much more deeply personal in many ways because the way we view it is so individualized. The way we interact with media is so individualized and so personal that it has become effective. It really affects us in, on an emotional level much more than um, the media has in previous times because that media was created for millions and millions and millions of people to watch or, or thousands of people to read or whatever. And it had to, had to really appeal to that specific audience and didn't really connect with them. We knew that and it didn't really connect with the, uh, you're reading a newspaper is fairly impersonal. Even watching a TV show is fairly impersonal, but now the way we consume media is so, um, again, personal, so intimate in a sense that it's very effective and it really has a, a much stronger effect on us. Uh, emotionally. So there's much more connection in that way. So lots of ways that media impacts us. Now, I do want to point out that context matters. We need to remember this as well, that the media is created in a particular time, in a particular place, in a particular society and culture. So we need to remember that context matters. So for example, you know, it's not just as simple as ABC, right? Because uh, we have ABC may also be 12, 13, 14, right? but sometimes those are the same thing. Right. So how do we know if that's a B or if it's a 13? What well, context matters when it's in the middle of the, when it's between an A and a C, that's a B. When it's between a 12 and a 13, that's a 14, right? Even though it's really the same thing. Context matters. And the same is true for media. Context matters to media. So, I, you know, as a child of the 80s, I can tell you grew up watching a lot of different movies and, and from that area, and, and some of them have not aged well. So context matters. When you go back and watch 16 Candles, for example, you, you meet this character named Long Duck Dong, which first of all, uh, the, 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 probably the, the name would not be appropriate at this point in, in our culture, but oh, man, what a, what a huge, uh, insensitive stereotyping of a, of an Asian person. 
Uh, a young Asian man uh, is Long Duck Dong. I mean, just every stereotype you can think of is in that movie and, and portrayed by this poor guy. And uh, so, uh, you know, that's an example. Or, you know, another popular movie in the 80s was The Toy where Jackie Gleason essentially buys or pays Richard Gleason to be a toy for his son because he's rich and can do that. I mean, that's not something you would probably, that's not a movie that probably gets made today. You know, he had music from people like Two Live Crew, which their their big song that was a huge controversy. I mean, this was enormous. It was Me So Horny, right? a song that now would almost be able to be played on the radio right on, on, on regular radio and maybe not quite that far, but certainly would be available on YouTube and everywhere else it was a huge thing. I mean, lots of lawsuits. They wanted to ban the music, wanted to ban the song and that just wouldn't be the case today. But even now, as we get into more current times, you had movies like, I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry, not very sensitive to the idea of gay marriage because at that time it wasn't really taken seriously. So, I mean, there's a lot of things in that movie that are, that are questionable or you, or you see a movie like shallow hell, uh, where, uh, you know, and we have Gwyneth Paltrow in a fat suit, right. And not a very good one, but, uh, these are things that would not run today, not be made today, but you have to remember in the context, and it's not to say they were, they were good at that time, but, but it was acceptable. Uh, it was different in those times. So you have to view it with that context in mind, right? Sometimes we, we get so focused on this specific thing, this specific whatever we're looking at, we're in this box and we can't figure out what it is and it doesn't make sense. But we, so we've got to pull back though and see the whole picture and understand that, okay, in the 80s, yeah, people were, were not very sensitive about Asian stereotypes at all. So that's why this was considered acceptable and, and to be and, and considered funny in that movie. Um, a funny character and a popular character, a well-known character from that movie, because, because we read it, we didn't know we, we weren't sensitive. We didn't think about those things. So we can, you got to pull back and consider that as a part of these things. When you examine that you would not want to, to do an analysis today of 16 candles by our standards, you've got to apply the standards of that time. Um, if that's what you're really doing. Okay. okay. All of this to say that, that we live in this media ecology. It's all over the place and it's, it's really wide and broad and it's magical and it's, it's, you know, has positive consequences and negative consequences. We've got to consider all of that as we view and examine and analyze um, these different artifacts. I hope this helps you understand um, ecological analysis as a form of critical media studies. I, I really hope this helps it make sense and give you some background and understanding of that. Um, if you have questions about ecological analysis or any other type of critical media studies, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope that this will, again, help you have that context and help provide the understanding of how media is a part of our world but and shapes our world, but is also shaped by us and, and uh, just the important um, perspective of media ecology as we examine different media artifacts.